We all know the story of Starship Block 2 exploding in the sky again, and we also know that Elon said it'd be ready to fly again in four to six weeks. So, what did they do to solve problems like Raptor Vacuum and getting the ship to come back in one piece? That's what we're going to find out today. But first, we need your support. This is my new space channel, and we're on the way to reaching the first 1,000 subscribers. Hit subscribe now and get ready for an out-of-this-world adventure. You won't be disappointed. Thank you very much. Now, let me just quickly address the problem that Starship is facing. Although Starship Block 2 has only just arrived, it is already encountering some issues with its propulsion system. A preliminary analysis of SpaceX's latest Starship flight has revealed harmonic vibrations problem in the fuel and oxidizer lines. These vibrations led to leaks and fires in the engine bay. During Flight 8, these issues were significant contributors to the explosion of one of the ship's vacuum engines. Prior to the engine's explosion, footage of the ship's skirt interior showed visible fires in the engine compartment, including a crack in the nozzle of one of the vacuum engines. Additionally, a keen-eyed commenter noticed a greenish-blue flame near the center of three sea-level raptors and adjacent to the vacuum raptor on the right, which likely resulted from leaking methane. When things went wrong and Starship began spinning, the propellant sloshed from one end to the other during the tumbles. However, at each turn, the methane level consistently remained lower than the oxygen level. Even during Flight 7, when the ship began to disintegrate, the methane levels dropped much faster than the oxygen levels. These observations indicate a flaw in the design of the methane pipeline in Starship Block 2. So, what do we do in this situation? Well, let's start with the first thing that blew up, the Raptor vacuum engine. Turns out, SpaceX already had a great solution right in front of them in the Falcon 9 rocket they've always used. The Falcon 9 booster is powered by nine Merlin engines, each carefully managed during flight by system-level vehicle management software. This software ensures optimal performance by autonomously shutting down engines in response to off-nominal indications, a capability that has been successfully demonstrated during actual missions. While the probability of catastrophic engine failure is minimal, and the design incorporates preemptive shutdown procedures to mitigate potential failures, each engine is housed within a dedicated metal bay. This design effectively isolates individual engines from their neighbors further enhancing the vehicle's resilience and safety during operation. If each Raptor engine on Starship were separated into its own metal compartment, if one exploded, it wouldn't be easy for the other engines to follow. The remaining engines could be used to steer the ship to a safe landing or even complete the mission, depending on the state of the Starship. Of course, to do that, we also have to upgrade the software that controls the thrust of the Raptor engines. If we just let them thrust at full speed, we will end up with a spinning starship like Fight 8. When an engine fails, the loss of thrust on that side disrupts the vehicle's symmetry. To counteract, the best thing to do is to turn off the engine altogether. Of course, we can't do that, so we move on to the next best thing. That is to slowly reduce power on the remaining engine in order to maintain control. Additionally, cold gas thrusters can be used to stop the ship from spinning. If we are lucky, we can salvage the ship for research for future flights. These improvements are just the beginning. We must also protect these engines from the hot staging phase. Following the first Starship test flight, all boosters have been equipped with an additional 1.8 metre tall vented interstage designed to facilitate hot staging. In this process, the next stage ignites its engines before stage separation rather than after which is typical in conventional staging. During hot staging, the preceding stage throttles down its engines to allow for a smooth transition. This approach simplifies the stage separation process, enhances payload capacity slightly, and eliminates the need for ullage motors. The acceleration from the nearly depleted first stage ensures the propellants remain settled at the bottom of the tanks, further optimizing the system's efficiency. SpaceX mastered this technique with Starship Block 1, however, when moving to Block 2, upgrades to the propulsion system made the process more violent than expected. 
The pressure spike during hot staging, combined with the chaotic environment caused by the reflected shock waves from the interaction of the six raptors firing off the hot stage ring, likely introduced additional forces into the engine compartment. To address this issue, one potential solution would be to eliminate the hot staging method altogether. However, the most effective and optimal approach for SpaceX is to utilize the Super Heavy Block 2 booster. With Super Heavy Block 2, the hot staging ring undergoes a complete redesign to address the challenges faced by previous iterations. The new ring is taller, a change that helps reduce the pressure during stage separation for both Super Heavy and Starship. Instead of the previous perforations, a tube truss design is now used, drawing inspiration from the interstage of the Soviet Soyuz rocket. This design not only increases the open cross-section for the exhaust to escape efficiently, but also simplifies construction. In a major shift, the hot staging ring is now integrated directly into the booster, eliminating the need for the entire separation system, streamlining the process, and improving overall performance. Additionally, the grid fins have been repositioned lower, further distancing them from the heat generated by the hot staging process. This adjustment provides extra protection for the fins, ensuring they remain unaffected by the intense heat and stress during stage separation. Now comes the tricky part, which is finding a way to solve the harmonic vibrations problem which was also one of the main causes of fire on the ship. The Starship's six engines are supplied with fuel through downcomers. In Block 1, there was a single downcomer for all six engines, which then branched into individual LCH4 lines for each engine. In Block 2, the design changed to include four downcomers. One central downcomer that now feeds only the three RSLs, and three separate downcomers that slope off the LCH4 tank sump, feeding directly through the LOX tank to each of the three RVACs. Maybe there's some thermal reason for it, or maybe this change was necessary for them to add three engines to Starship in V3. I don't know. But while the specific purpose of this change has not been announced by the company, the increase in the number of pipelines just makes the problem of harmonic vibration worse. After conducting some research, I found a rocket with a similar design. The legendary Saturn V, specifically its first stage, the SIC. Standing 138 feet tall and 33 feet in diameter, the SIC was powered by five F1 engines fueled by liquid oxygen and RP-1 kerosene. Each F1 engine produced just over 1.5 million pounds of thrust, giving the Saturn V a total liftoff thrust of 7.6 million pounds. Liquid oxygen was supplied to each F1 engine through five separate suction lines, ensuring a steady flow of fuel to power the massive engines. During its early flights, the Saturn V also had vibration problems, especially during the Apollo 6 mission. They called it the Pogo problem. Yes, that's exactly the Pogo you're thinking of. Pogo oscillation is a self-excited vibration in liquid propellant rocket engines caused by combustion instability. If this definition is a bit confusing, here's what George Mueller, NASA's Associate Administrator for Manned Spaceflight, explained about Apollo 6's Pogo oscillation during a congressional hearing. Pogo arises fundamentally because you have thrust fluctuations in the engines. Those are normal characteristics of engines. All engines have what you might call noise in their output because the combustion is not quite uniform. So you have this fluctuation in thrust of the first stage as a normal characteristic of all engine burning. Now, in turn, the engine is fed through a pipe that takes the fuel out of the tanks and feeds it into the engine. That pipe's length is something like an organ pipe, so it has a certain resonance frequency of its own, and it really turns out that it will oscillate just like an organ pipe does. The structure of the vehicle is much like a tuning fork, so if you strike it right, it will oscillate up and down longitudinally. In a gross sense, it is the interaction between the various frequencies that causes the vehicle to oscillate. If the pulse cycle coincides with the rocket's resonant frequency, it can trigger dangerous oscillations through positive feedback, which, in extreme cases, could cause the vehicle to break apart.
In the case of the S1C, the flexibility in the center engine support structure allowed the length of the center engine's LOX suction line to fluctuate. This variation caused the LOX pressure at the pump entrance to change, which in turn led to fluctuations in engine thrust. This phenomenon was transmitted to the outer engines, resulting in the entire rocket shaking beyond the plus or minus 0.2 G limit. During the unmanned Apollo 6 mission, the oscillations were strong enough to damage the vehicle and could have been harmful to astronauts had they been aboard. The pogo problem was not new to rocketry. Early launch vehicles like the Thor, as well as the Titan II used for the Gemini program, experienced similar issues. The Saturn V also faced this problem during the Apollo 4 mission, though to a lesser extent. So what did NASA engineers do to solve this problem? To help address the POGO issue, they pressurized cavities in the outboard liquid oxygen pre-valves, allowing them to act as vibration absorbers. At T-11 minutes during the countdown, GSE helium was used to pressurize the pre-valve cavities, while support personnel closely monitored pressure and LOX liquid levels. This process effectively created an accumulator that shifted the resonant frequencies of the LOX suction line. There are also intriguing theories suggesting that the issue may stem from the new dome design of the fuel tank. The updated domes are more spherical, which alters the behaviour of standing waves and significantly impacts the self-resonant frequency of each tank as the fuel level fluctuates. This phenomenon is known as Helmholtz resonance, a type of resonance that occurs when air is forced in and out of a cavity causing the air inside to vibrate at a specific natural frequency. It's a principle we encounter in everyday life, such as when blowing across the top of a bottle to produce a resonant tone. In the case of the tanks, these resonant effects could contribute to unexpected behaviour during flight. Of course, the solutions being proposed remain highly theoretical, and whether they will prove effective can only be determined through rigorous testing something only SpaceX engineers can undertake. With their innovative thinking, it's entirely possible SpaceX will come up with a solution even more ingenious than we can imagine. It's definitely exciting to watch how they tackle these challenges and see what they come up with next.